aficionado is going to introduce our speaker. So thank you, Linda. Good morning. I'd, I'd like to know how many our visitors have come with an alley member. Welcome. So this is your first introduction to um, what we call trying to expand our art piece of Ali. And Roger is no stranger to us. We're privileged to have Roger Aiken with us today. And he's done many different presentations for us prior to Zoom. So of course that means prior to the pandemic, if that helps. Um, he has been and is a retired professor of art history from Crichton University. And we're very privileged to have him associate with us and the Ducks. Uh, Roger, in the past presentations, and I understand he's going to do a little bit of the same today, he really challenges us to see things through an artist's or a director's eyes. He's challenged us to see color and light, position, motion, very differently than just being the viewer of art or of a movie. So when I asked him if he was going to take us on that journey today, he said, with surprises. So I, I know you can count on that. Roger likes to uh, facilitate questions and answers himself. So please make sure that if you have a question that Roger can hear it and then he will repeat it for the rest of the group, both um, here and on Zoom. It's my pleasure to introduce Roger Aiken. Enjoy the journey, the Sunday walk through Rome. Great. Yeah. Can you hear me? I don't know. I was going nervous. <laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is it uh, okay? A little louder. Louder. A little louder. Yeah. Yeah, turn it up. Now, thank you very much for coming. This is great. Um, and please ask questions, raise your hand, and just start talking. <laughs> um, how many of you have been to Lou? Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, can you hear me now? A little more. A little more. Thank you. No, no, no. Now, down, more down. That's okay. That's the best I can do. Yeah. Um, I thought maybe half of you, but everybody's been to Rome. <laughs> I um, lived in Rome for a year with my wife doing research 50 years ago. <laughs> and, um, Roger. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. I'm going to be working with the technology. So, uh, Sunday is a good day to walk in Rome because we might survive. Well, Romans are colorblind, red, green, and no concept. <laughs> and maybe you can turn the lights out. I think we're ready. Are you ready to screen share? Yes. Yes. Screen share. Bear with us for a sec while we do that. Yes. Okay. Okay, we're waiting for likes. Thank you. Oh, that's okay. Okay. Uh, this is a uh, self-portrait. I'm in the lower right. Uh, a Sunday walk in Rome. And as the guys say, a Roman ambassador in a vita. A lifetime. Is not we have, we're going to fix one thing in Zoom so that we have just about as many people in Zoom with us. We want to make sure that we... Okay, we good. 
Okay. Here we go. Yeah, room a lifetime is not enough. Yeah, man, a lifetime is not enough. Rome is a wonderful city. You see domes all the time. Um, now, these are the original seven years of Rome, the original walls. But this is Rome in the third century. Look at the scale of miles. Two, half a mile. It's only three miles each way. And Rome had a million people in, at this time. And you can see the aqueduct. Do I have a mouse? No. Oh, there it is. Yeah. See the aqueducts? Uh, over the years, the Romans, as you know, brought water in from the as far as 20 miles. Uh, and uh, Roger? Yes. Well, did any other ancient city compare in size to Rome? I don't know the answer to that, but I would in, in the third century, uh, what would you say? Athens. Athens. Perhaps Athens, maybe something in the Middle East. Maybe something in the Americas. But their uh, infrastructure was uh, astounding, and there are sewers also. So Rome would easily fit inside the city limits of Italy. <laughs> Easily. And of course, the aqueducts went for miles. <clears throat> this is a model of Rome. It took 40 years to build. And you see the aqueduct coming to the, to the Palatine Hill. There it is. Look at this. That's ancient Roman engineering. Well, an emperor has to have water. Okay. Um, now, in the Middle Ages, because of the barbarian invasions, Rome emptied out. The aqueducts were cut. Now this is probably 1600. Everybody had to move down to the Tiber to get water. And there was a Pope fight. <laughs> you remember the Pope was taken to Avignon uh, in the late 14th century. And there was still a Pope in Rome. And at one point there were three Popes. Um, but, in 1414, Martin V brought the papacy unified and brought it back to Rome. And this is the city today. And as you can see, there is, if I do this, yeah, this street here, the Corso Victoria Emanuele, that's the only street really that was cut through um, by in the 19th century. And there it is, you see the, the Victor Emmanuel Street. So you couldn't get to St. Peter's. But for the most part, the old center of Rome, called the Campo Marcio, is the same way it was hundreds of years ago. We did not do this. <laughs> they did not do this. Oh, we are really finding out that our freeway have cut and isolated cities. Uh, right. Can we take a cab? Uh, Unfortunately, there, there is a lot of traffic in Rome. It's four million people outside the wall. And the center where we're going to be spending most of our time, uh, they kick cars out of a lot of it. And it's a great city for walking. And we are going to start right here on the Via del Governo Vecchio, which is where I live. I was able to sublet. We had a roof terrace. Yeah. The building we lived in was built in the 14th century. And the Romans have a phrase, Luce in Piazza, life in the Piazza, which was both a book and a musical. And when you walk, the light is just wonderful. And again, all these streets, most of them are, are free of traffic. When you walk in Rome, you might have a destination in mind, but you'll probably never get there. Uh, <laughs> you'll get sidetracked. All the walls have these wonderful textures um, and cats. There are quite a few cats in Rome. Now, uh, somebody asked me, these are my photographs. It'll be easy to tell which ones are mine. They're not all from the web. 
Or I just sit in the sun. It's a nice October Sunday. And a lot of people sit and look out their windows and of course they hang their clothes outside. And the walls are these wonderful textures, their little shrines. And when you walk in Rome, you'll often see ancient Roman architectural elements included in the more recent building. Uh, and this is actually a rare bookshop. And when I was there 50 years ago, there was a copy of Palladio's ten books on our four books on architecture, 1570, first edition. Could have had it for a hundred dollars. Current price. <laughs> yeah, we've all been there, right? Think about that. And Keith's Roadshow. Uh, okay, what do the Romans do on a beautiful Sunday afternoon? They make the bella figura, which is not just looking good, it's how to live, love, and eat the Italian way. The bella figura. You look good. You go in piazza, you make the passeggiata, and you can really embarrass your friends if you do not look good. <laughs> Men and women. That's a little over the top for me, but <laughs> here's some more guys that look good. Well, Italians are God's gift to women. We don't. <laughs> now, these are Italian policemen. Guess who designed their uniforms? Close. Armani. Look, we give up. You look so good. <laughs> then there's Ruta Figura. That would be tourists. <laughs> this is London, but it's the same thing. This is probably perfect. All the things you should not wear in Rome. Uh, and here's a list of very interesting clothes to leave at home. Any logos, yeah. Well, we can't compete with the times anyway, but you should try. Now, if this was not a Sunday, we would go down to the main market called the Campo dei Fiori, where Italians shop almost every day and get fresh food. And this is the field of flowers, it's called. Just show you a couple of pictures. There's a stalls and vegetables. Here is the fish, and you get eels from the timer. And I love this fish of this woman and her son. She's so proud of her son, and they sell fruit. And you would pay with the most beautiful currency in the world. Before the euro, this is the Italian 10,000 lira note, which comes in at about $15. Okay. Where is that on there? That is Michelangelo. And on the left, the watermark is the data. But of course, there was a lot of inflation. So 10,000 lira isn't that much. Gorgeous person. Now, you can walk your baby, but you don't get anywhere. Because people will stop. will stop you. Mm -hmm. Or you can pick up a kitten. Oh. Yeah, it's cute. I always wondered what happened to this kitten. Uh, that's cute. <laughs> this is the best coffee in Rome, San Estacio, which apparently needs a guard. Kind of in Yami. And there are all kinds of signs in the walls. The walls are always interesting. This is a no littering sign by order of the master of the streets. One is prohibited from throwing any garbage, alcuna immunditia. This is from the 18th century. And of course, it's an open invitation, as you know. I don't know what they did with it. Rome still has a garbage. And there are flags showing the floodwaters. These are all from the uh, 16th century, because the Tiber flooded all the time for 2,000 years. And Raised the city, and we'll get back to that. Or here's another wonderful shrine uh, with plaques. And I love this little, this little uh, plaque. 
Leonardo, we will never ever forget you. Your friends from school. Look at that word, you make it That's why Italian is the language of music. Okay, now we're gonna walk down from my house about two blocks and we come to a beaten up old statue. It's called the Pasquino. There was no freedom of speech in papal Rome. If you criticize somebody publicly, especially the Pope, you could get in big trouble. So this was a bulletin board for criticism, almost always in verse. There's, you know, the scurrilous comments that have been put up, like this one. That quando Nicolo e Papa e assassino abonda a Roma il sangue e scarso il vino. Nicholas is saying, who, who did that? And it's still a bulletin board. I think at one point the city tried to close it off, but um, still functions that way. Okay, now, one of the things about Rome is that you rarely see something until you're right in the middle of the action. And we turn a corner, and there is Piazza Navona, one of the greatest city spaces in the world. Um, it's a, a circus. Well, literally, this is in the pandemic. Grass was growing because nobody could go out. The ancient Romans went to the stadium of Domitian, which is, which is this, to watch the Agones, which apparently became Navona eventually. And as you see, it's shaped like a circus. This is where we came from, right up here. And there's the Pasquino. So the circus could have been here. And the more recent buildings, as you can see, are built right on top of the old circus. Ancient Rome is always down there. Because the city has risen 10, 20, or 30 feet over the centuries. It's a layer cake. <laughs> I think the technical word is a palimpsest. And because of the floods. Indeed, if you went in the forum in the 18th century, you see the arch of Septimius Severus is covered with 20 feet of dirt. And it's all been excavated now. So the whole city has arisen. And uh, we'll get back to that. Well, here is a whole city block called the Largo Argentina, where they've excavated down 20 feet to ancient Rome. This is right in the middle of Rome. Yes? What's the altitude of Rome? Good question. It can't be more than 200 feet. So it's very close to sea level. Yeah, yeah. And the tides were flooded for years. Right. But it's got to it's, it's got to be close to sea level. It is about 40 miles from the ocean. Now, if we go into this beautiful church, this is a, a St. Agnes by the great Baroque architect Francesco Borromini. And we go down in the crypt. We're back in ancient Rome. Now, the centerpiece of the piazza is the great fountain of the Four Rivers by John Lorenzo Bernini. Any of you remember this? Yeah. Uh, the whole piazza is wonderful, especially at Christmas in Advent. Now, this fountain is a magnet. Uh, it was done by John Lorenzo Bernini. That's him. He was the greatest artist of his age. Answer, chat. It's a magnet. You sit, read, Watch people go by, flirt. Uh, <clears throat> and you walk around it a dozen times. You see something new every time. Day or night. <laughs> there are animals that peek out. It's built to look like a ruin. 
And it would be right at home in Disneyland. <laughs> it's kind of a confession, you know, very lighthearted, with plants growing in it. There's a lion. This, the drain is a serpent. It was commissioned by the new pope, Innocent X on Thieves, who became pope in 1644. And if you're interested, this was, this doesn't look very happy, does it? Looks <laughs> suspicious. This was the model for the British expressionist surrealist Francis Bacon, who did the Screaming Pope series. <laughs> if you remember this, um, well, innocent. Yeah, the, the, the Pantheon Palace is right here on the left. Every new pope would decorate his corner of Rome using the vast papal treasury to do it. And the, the uh, fountain has a program. The dove of the Holy Spirit on top is the symbol of the Pantili family. And then you have the obelisk, the rays of the sun, <laughs> and the four rivers of the earth spreading the gospel to the four corners of the earth with the water. You have the Rhine on the left, the Ganges, the Ore, the Nile, its face is covered because its source was unknown, apparently, and the river Rio de la Plata in South America. Now, there's gold in South America, and you can see the gold uh, coins under the river guide. And it seems to be reacting because a snake is trying to steal his gold. But the um, architect of the fountain, Bernini, and the architect of the church, Borromini, were bitter rivals. And some people say that the river god is recording in horror as the church is going to Well, unfortunately, the church hadn't been built yet. <laughs> but as the Italians say, si non è vero e ben trovato. If it ain't true, it ought to be. <laughs> You'll hear more of that kind of stuff later. Now, Bernini, there is a wonderful story about the commission of this family. Bernini had worked for every Roman noble family and several popes. And if you go to Rome, go to the Villa Borghese, which now requires reservations. Every place you want to go in Rome now, you have to get reservations. But in that villa are sculptures by Bernini that he did in his 20s and 30s. A gorgeous museum. And I just wanted to show you some of these. This is Apollo, excuse me, Pluto and Persephone. Do you remember the myth that Pluto took Persephone down to the underworld and everything died? Um, and uh, the, she, he agreed to give her back half the year, and then we have spring and summer. But look at the details. And this one, is this is culture. Incredible. This is Bernini. This is another abduction, Apollo and Daphne. You remember this one? Apollo's chasing Daphne, who cried out to her father to save her. His name was Peneus, he's a minor god. And her father turned her into a laurel tree, which is happening right before our eyes. You, you couldn't imagine that this could be done with a sculpture. She's growing bark and leaves. Look at the leaves. This is a sculpture. I, I don't understand how they did it. Now, Bernini had a huge workshop. He did not do all of this himself. He had specialists. Look at the roots growing out of the toes. Oh, wow. Now, I had a friend in Rome who was studying Bernini. And he said Bernini had a, a particular master who was in charge of carving the plants the leaves and the roots, and that this man had previously been a chef. Okay, guess what his specialty? 
Worship me. Which one? This is worship me. What else? Okay. And of course, Bernini is David, which is turning and twisting and moving. Everything that Baroque is turning and twisting. You don't have a single point of view. Uh, this David is an adult, and apparently it's also a self portrait of Bernini. If you want to know the difference between Renaissance and Baroque art, this is it. Michelangelo and Bernini. And Bernini's, oh, I can't show you this, I'm sorry. That was a joke. <laughs> but Bernini's saying to, this, to Michelangelo, don't just stand there, don't just stand there. <laughs> anyway, Bernini had also worked for the previous Pope, Urban VIII Barberini. And I'm sorry, Bernini for Bernini Barberini. But it's not my fault. And Bernini had worked for Ur Urban and had done, among other things, the final decorations for the new St. Peter's, which, as you know, took forever to build. 130, 40 years. But finally, they were ready for the decorations. And Bernini did the great canopy over the high altar. You've probably seen this many times. Um, 90 feet tall, 70 tons of bronze. Where do you get 70 tons of bronze? In Rome in 1630. Well, hold that thought. Anyway, Innocent X, the new pope, did not like the Barberini. And he swore that nobody who worked for Urban VIII was going to work for him. Which included Bernini, who was the logical person to do the fountain. Well, Bernini still had friends in the Pope's, the new Pope's entourage, and they told Bernini, the Pope, he's upset. Uh, why don't you make a model of your design for the fountain? We'll put it where the Pope can see it, and we won't tell him anything. <laughs> and this is a model of Mozzetto. And the Pope walked by with his entourage. They put it on the table. The Pope walked by with his entourage and looked at the fountain. And he said, that damn Bernini. <laughs> the only way to avoid building his designs is not to see them. Because he knew he had to build. He knew Bernini had done the model and he knew he had to do the fountain. Now, that story is told by Bernini's biographer. So it may actually be true. <laughs> Unlike some of the things you're hearing, you might hear this. You know, never have been turned off. Okay, now it's time for a little rest. We'll sit down at Master Stefano's, have a latte, a dolce, and watch the world go by at Piazza del Mono. And the Romans have seen a lot of the world go by. And they are not impressed. <laughs> I can tell you. Now, we're going to go just east of the piazza, right here. You see that? It's a wonderful little street, narrow street, called the Via de Sediari, the street of the chairmaker. And there, you see, there's still chairmakers on this street. Many of the trades in Rome, ancient Rome, modern Rome, tended to concentrate on one street. And the streets were named for the trades. I like this the street of the crossbow makers. <clears throat> well, like I said, there are three still chairmakers on this street. And the story goes that there used to be four, and the families have known each other forever. And one of the chairmakers decided to advertise, and he put up a sign. Maybe the only Satan in Roma thought they could. Well, the second chairmaker, not to be outdone, put up a sign. Maybe the only Satan in Italy thought they could. What does that mean? I don't know. Best chairs in Italy. Right? And it was the bottom part. 
Being here. Okay, best chairs in Rome, made it here. Best chairs in Italy, made it here. So the third chair maker put them aside. Best chairs in the world, made it here. Two for the one. So the fourth chair maker put them aside. And, and what did it say? Universe. Best chairs on this street. <laughs> I love this story. And there is a wonderful hotel here called Hotel Navona, right in the middle of the world. Navona. Like Piazza Navona. 100 yards from Piazza Navona. And uh, you can look it up on the web. It's a lot more expensive than it was when I was there. Hotel Navona. Um, Perfect location. Don't let them stick you outside the walls. We didn't go to one. And more streets. The Via del Piedi Marmo, the street of the marble foot. Here's the marble foot. A lot of feet in Rome. Here's another person looking at the marble foot. And there are a lot of feet in Rome. <laughs> so fragments of colossal statues that have been located in museums or everywhere. Ancient Rome is always there. It's in, it's in fragments, it's underneath everything. Now, here is about three quarters of a mile of Rome. And you see the green buildings. Every green building is a church. Here, here, here. There are hundreds of churches in Rome. And you always, you, you go by a church and you say, well, what could possibly be in there? You should always go in. This is the French church in Rome, San Luigi dei Francesi. Nice. Last chapel on the left. Turn the lights on. You have to put a hundred lira in the mirror. Well, that was years ago. Scenes from the life of St. Matthew by the great revolutionary bad boy Caravaggio right around 1600 who transformed painting all over Europe, especially in Holland. He brought painting down to earth. Painting had been very aloof, very stylized, very mannered, and he used real people. Now, this doesn't look that extraordinary. The St. Matthew writing the gospel, listening to the angel. This is the second painting done for the altar. The first one was refused by the patrons. And it's easy to see why. This St. Matthew is illiterate. He can't hold a pencil. The angel's touching him. He's sticking his dirty foot in your face. And the patron said, no, no. Not dignified enough. And this, unfortunately, has been lost. Now, the most famous of the paintings is the calling of St. Matthew where Christ emerges from the shadows and points at St. Matthew. Just like taxi driver, you talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> yes, your life is about to change. Uh, and St. Matthew is surrounded by his posse, his crew of young Roman thugs. But they look good. <laughs> Very wonderful, very dramatic. Now, does this gesture remind you of anything? <laughs> yes. Well, Caravaggio's first name was Michelangelo. But I think in Italy, if you want someone to come here, you do this. Not. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Not this. This is for dogs. <laughs> Gestures. Do not always translate. Mm. Depending on what country you're in, you can get in big trouble. <laughs> okay. I'm not an expert in this, but I know that in Greece, don't do this. And really don't do this. Never do this. And in Iran, really don't do this. 
if you go to a reading. Um, right. Good. Bad. <laughs> Did you know this? I didn't. Good. Bad. The Italians have over 200 gestures. Do not do them. Okay, what does this mean? Two outs in baseball and Book of Lawrence, Texas. If you're from Texas and you go to Italy, Book of Lawrence. No. This, these are horns. They're Konuki, they're called. Shakespeare. She gave him a pair of horns. This means your wife is unfaithful to you. <laughs> and here is the former prime minister of Italy, Silvio Berlusconi, insulting the prime minister of Spain. So, no, no. He was sort of a weird guy. What else? Oh, yes, one more. If you're on the Autobahn in Germany, and you pass on the right, which we do all the time, but which is streng verboten on the autobahn. You may not pass on the right. And the guy you are passing on the left lane does this. That does not mean okay. <laughs> so I don't, I'm tempted to say, you're, you know, just keep your hands in your pockets. <laughs> You can't do that either, because in some countries, like the UK, talking to someone with your hands in your pockets is rude. So I give up. Fountains of Rome, they're all over. Little tucked away places. Here's a wonderful elephant. A large gorgon. Here's a wonderful little fountain. And they're cast all over Rome. They were. And this is the University of Rome. The fountain's made out of books. But of course, the greatest fountain, beyond, as well as the four rivers, is the Trinity. This is a magnet. Everybody goes there. I don't know if when you went to Rome, if you went here, but most people do. You can see it's a madhouse. Um, do not even bring your wallet to this place. Everybody's reaching for their money. Uh, Rome is a pickpocket's paradise. And this is in the movie The Dolce Vita. Marcello Mascheroni and Anita Eckberg go into the Trevi family, and the water turns off. <laughs> and this is where you throw a coin over your shoulder to return to work. And millions of coins end up in this fountain. Mm -hmm. And when I was there, nobody was quite sure who they belonged to. But the city of Rome says it collects them and gives them to the poor. <laughs> right? Well, when I was there, the young men who hung out at the fountain thought they were poor enough <laughs> would periodically mount a raid on the fountain, pick up some coins, the police would pretend to chase them. It was a great show. <laughs> oh, where are we? oh, yes, this is not actually a fountain, it's a drain, an ancient Roman drain, <clears throat> and it has a unique ability, apparently, called the Boca del Verita, the mouth of truth. And you can, it's right near uh, the capital. If you remember the famous movie, Roman Holiday, with Gregory Peck and uh, Audrey Hepburn. Well, let's see. Do we have sound at all? No. It, uh, it must be here. Sorry. How do I get sound? I'm sorry, I forgot to fix it. We keep testing it before it worked, and now it's. Uh, here we go. I can see with the price. Sorry. Sorry. We'll we'll get it. Question. Name of the other ones where they were in the fountain. Now don't you read that? This the sweet life. 
Oops, sorry. I want this work. No. Sorry. I'm not perfect. Oh, there it is. Well. I'm so sorry, folks. Okay. 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 It wasn't working. The mouth of truth. The legend is that if you're given to lying, you put your hand in there, it'll be bitten off. Oh, a hard idea. Well, what happens is there is no. The mouth of truth. The legend is that if you're given to lying, you put your hand in there, it'll be bitten off. Oh, a hard idea. Let's see you do it. Single stones of granite iron. 
and they came from Upper Egypt. Thirty times, right? How do I be the engineer in charge of putting up these columns? Marvelous, yes. I want you to go to Upper Egypt, get me 14 huge rocks, bring them down the Nile, across the Mediterranean, up the Tiber, bring them to the building site, carve them into identical single columns, put them up, and don't break one. Yes. Now, the porch of the Pantheon, the ceiling, used to have huge bronze coffers as decoration, and they're gone. Well, I gave away the game. Guess where? They, guess what happened to these bronze coffers? They were repurposed for the high altar of Saint Peter's. That's where you get seventy tons of bronze. But again, ancient Rome serves modern Rome, and a wonderful post appeared on the Pasquino. Quod non fecerunt barbari, fecerunt barbari. Okay, now we want to go to the capital. There we go. Here's the Pantheon where we are. We're just going to go down here to the capital, one of the seven hills of Rome, it's just uh, to the left, to the right of the Tiber. And it had the Temple of Capitoline Jove in the antiquity. It was the center of Rome, the center of the world. Was the Capitoline Hill. Now, today, the Capitol is sort of back here. You know, just, you know, back here on the right, upper right, is dominated by the Victor Emmanuel Monument, which the Italians call the typewriter. Machina <laughs> da scrivere. And you see the Victor Emmanuel Monument on the right. And the capital on the left, on the left, on the right, you go up these beautiful stairs, past these ancient Roman sculptures, to this gorgeous piazza and palaces. You see St. Peter's way in the background? Mm -hmm. Now, this was designed by Michelangelo, the piazza and palaces. And in the center is the famous statue of Marcus Aurelius. Which survived above ground since antiquity because they thought it was constituted. The Romans never bothered to invent the stone. <laughs> now, the capital became a site for collecting ancient Roman sculpture. Here's the courtyard of the palace, including this fragments of this colossal statue of Constantine. The head is six feet tall, and it came from this building, which you can see from the Capitol, the Basilica of Constantine. And this is a reconstruction of the Basilica. And you see this statue in the far right, gigantic. That was what it looked like in antiquity, and they brought the head to the Capitol. Well, how did the Romans of 1600 see their relationship to ancient Rome, which was all around the Romanian? Well, they had two kind of models, and two ways of thinking. One was the dream in the book of Daniel. If you remember Daniel's dream, he saw four beasts with wings and horns and was very complicated. These were interpreted to represent the four earthly empires, of which Rome was the last. Rome was continuing. And when Rome ends, history will end. And the other model was the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, prefiguration fulfillment. So ancient Rome is the pagan prefiguration of modern Christian Rome. But all part of God's divine plan, as the Romans of 1600 can tell you. So here's a literal example. You have the column of Trajan with St. Peter on top. 
Ancient Rome is the pedestal for modern Rome. And this relationship is carried out in the decoration of the palace. This is the conservator's palace in this point. This was the city hall in Renaissance and Baroque Rome. This is where the city fathers met to do business. And on the right is a plaque dedicating the building in Arnold Post Salutis Initium, Beginning of Salvation, 1568. And on the left, a plaque dedicating the building, Arnold Post Urban Condita, a year after the founding of the city, 2320. Ancient Rome modern. Now, a little bit of a time out. When you go around Rome, there are a lot of different ways of, of marking years. Here is an aqueduct built by Paul V, Arnold Domini, 1612. And then later, Arnold Pontificatus Sui, year of his pontificate, seven. And that's a very common thing to do for popes, like the fountain of the bees built by Urban VIII, one of his maxims. Arno, you see here, can you see that? Yeah, Arno Domini, 1644, Arno Pontificatus, year of pontificate, 21. So there's the two ways of doing years. But one day I was walking around the Junicolo Hill when I saw this. Arno, 18 E F. Well, what is that? Any ideas? Ira Fascista. Fascist era. Mussolini renamed the years too. He said he was a pope, a pope or an emperor. Mussolini. So I know 18 year of fascism. Well, inside the palace, we have the same kind of relationship. On the walls are paintings of ancient Roman heroes. This is a, a guy named Horatio at the bridge, and he defended the bridge from a whole army while his uh, fellow and his soldiers destroyed the bridge in back of a very famous event from Republican Rome. This man, Lucius Scavo, a young man named Lucius, there was a, uh, a rival king, I think on the left, who was camped outside of Rome and was going to attack the next day. And Lucius snuck into the camp to assassinate the king, but the king had a body double and he killed the wrong guy. So he was brought before the king and to show his contempt, held his hand over a plane. Like Gordon Lee, right? Or Vincent Van Gogh. And, and apparently this scared the king so much that he left him out of that <laughs> Well, I know, I believe it. Who's the scaler? The word scaler in Latin means lefty. In front of the paintings, you have statues of modern Roman heroes. This is a man named Mark Antonio Colonna, who commanded the papal fleet with several other Christian fleets in a very famous battle against the Turks in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Battle of Lepanto. Anybody ever heard of it? Yeah, it's, it's not much known these days. In 1571, but I guess we could all be speaking Turkish. And it's always associated with the Madonna of the Rosary, which is October 7th. And to this day, on October 7th, the Pope meets in the Vatican with the descendants of the people who fought this battle. The other guy in the room. This is a man named 
Alessandro Guarnese. He led an army to Northern Europe and was waiting on the shore of the English Channel in 1588 to be ferried over to conquer England. Well, as you know, his ride never arrived. There is no Farnese column in Armada Square in front of the Spanish gallery in London. Yeah, um, the folks ran Rome and they kept reminding the city fathers that they were really in charge and would occasionally send a statue back. The city, this is the main audience hall of the city hall. This is Urban VIII presiding over the city hall. Um, that would be like Donald Trump sending a balloon to the House of Representatives. We know the 10th century statue about 1517. They tend to think that all Renaissance art is great. But, you know, not so good. Uh, no, probably not. Leo was probably not the right guy to have in 1517. Now, you can see the Colosseum from the capital. Which was used as a stone quarry for years until the Pope stopped it. And we can get our picture taken with a gladiator <laughs> or what? A gladiatrix. Yeah, more touring. What a way to go. Seated 50,000 people. And they had naval battles in the Colosseum. You remember the movie Gradient Talk? It was not filmed in the Coliseum, obviously, but I just found out that they built a huge set on the island of Malta and hired about 20,000 extras, and the rest is computer graphics. Right now, for the nerds in the audience, what shape is the Colosseum? An oval. But what is an oval? Is it an ellipse? A true ellipse, as you know, has R1 and R2, and those distances are always the same. You can put two pins in a pencil and string and make an ellipse, a true ellipse. But I believe the, the uh, knowledge of the ellipse had been lost until about 1500. But the Colosseum has been so moved around it may just be what's called a multi sacred circle. And you can see that the radii, here, this radius is here. And if you go up here, you get this one. And if you go up to here, you get this radius. So if you're interested, <laughs> um, now the Colosseum for years was overgrown. A den of thieves, cow pasture, full of plants. And beginning in the 17th century, botanists began to collect and catalog the plants of the Colosseum. Flora, culminating in a right hand book by an English doctor of, 16, of 1850. Now, many of these plants grew nowhere else in Europe. They had come from the far reaches of their own empire. This one's still there. Sterosa. What's it called? Sterosa. So this was the French or Museum of the Flora of the Roman Empire. And then the archaeologists arrived and tore the plants up through the way. <laughs> And today, the Colosseum is as a, a venue for performances, which you can see. Well, where are we now? Just up the street, between the Colosseum and the background, is a wonderful little church 
of San Clemente. There's a beautiful courtyard. This church was built in the 12th century. And inside you see this gorgeous mosaic, iron and golden columns, which is very typical and wonderful pavement. But there's more. The Irish priests who run this place have excavated under the 12th century church. This is the fourth century church, the first church built there. And there are wall paintings honoring St. Clement. Now, let me set this up. These paintings then date from about 1100. And they show this one. The story is a little complicated, bear with me. The man on the right is a man named Cecinius, who was a favorite of the, of the Emperor Trajan, and he's persecuting Clement. He's trying to capture him. But Clement, as miraculous, who's uh, the next figure from the left, St. Clement has miraculously fooled the empty Cecinius and his laborers into thinking that he, Clement, is a stone column, which they're trying to lift. And there are speech bubbles. This is St. Clement in Latin. Because you are hard hearted, you are condemned to full stones. That's what he says. And Cecilius says in Italian, to his laborers, which means, full oh, you sons of bitches. <laughs> and apparently, it's an Italian. It's one of the first examples of Italian in walking. Either because they thought it was inappropriate to put these words into Latin, or they didn't know the words, but this is what it looks like today. These festivals don't last for a long. But there's more. At the end of the ash, you go down another 15 feet, and you're back in each Roman apple. 30 feet below ground. And on one side of the alley is the original house where the first services took place. And on the other side is a Mithraeum, a shrine devoted to the god Mithra, which was one of the odd, mysterious religions of the third century. Nobody knows much about it. Something to do with a hero and a bull and blood and a pup and a snake. Well, if Constantine had converted, converted to Mithra, things would be different. Okay, well, we're almost done. Where are we? <clears throat> we were here at the Colosseum, we're on this street. We're going to go way over here to the Janicolo Hill, to Piazza Garibaldi. A little bit of a walk where we get a wonderful view back over the city to the east. This is a piazza yeah, so honoring the Argentinian Italian patriot Garibaldi uh, and his compatriots. And there's a big noble equestrian statue of Garibaldi. There was also a statue of his wife. Her name was Anita, uh, also Argentinian. Uh, she's very famous. Two movies have been made about her. She was with Garibaldi every step of the way and bore four children and died very young of cholera. She was regarded as the greatest horse woman of her day. And she needed to be because, as you can see, she is shown riding a rearing horse side saddle with a pistol in one hand and a baby in the other. <laughs> what a woman. Perfect <laughs> <laughs> Okay, where are we? 
Well, we're going to end up, sorry, down. Yeah, okay, here we go. Right here is a cemetery we're going to end up in. But on the way is this strange hill. It shouldn't be there. It's not a natural hill. It's 300 feet high. The Romans traded all over the world, sent things all over the world, and what did they use for packing material? Amphorus. Pots. And some of them very large, the one in the end. These are huge. The same grain or wine or fish paste. And when they were done with them, they brought them up and put them on this hill, which ended up 100 feet high, two, two, two or 300 feet high. See that? These are all pots for hundreds of years, called the Monte Testacchio, the mountain of pot shards. And now we can see where we're going finally up here. These trees and that little white pyramid. That is, excuse me, sorry. Yeah, there it is. It's called the Pyramid of Cestinus. And the cemetery is on the right. These are the walls of the city. The cemetery is right down by the walls. This is called the Protestant Cemetery in Rome. Or technically the non-Catholic cemetery, the Cimiterio a Catolico for foreigners. <coughs> and if you were not Catholic, before the cemetery was established, you really should not die in Rome because they had nowhere to put you. <laughs> but by now, in the early 19th century, there was a large international community, especially English Protestants. And this cemetery was established. And you see an engraving here of, of uh, 1819. There are already some graves in the cemetery. Now, the cemetery is run by, it's, it's um, works on donations. It's on the web if you want to check it out. Uh, it's run by a board consisting of the directors of the five foreign academies. American, English, French, German, Swedish. But they had, in my day, when I was there, a resident Italian director for day-to-day -day operations. And I needed to meet him. And he gave me his card. The director of the Protestant Cemetery at that time was named Signor Rimo Morbidelli. Morbidelli, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, the word morbido in Italian doesn't mean morbid, it means soft. Mm -hmm. But Signore Morbidelli knows English very well and delights in giving his card to unsuspecting <laughs> English speakers. <laughs> and I'm trying to say I passed with colors. <laughs> well, so here is on the right the old section, which you can't get into anymore. And on the left, the recent section, there are 4,000 graves here. And it's very difficult. It's a very difficult cemetery to get into now. I mean, you know, permanently. <laughs> <laughs> and there are signs telling you, that, you know, who's here? Well, who's here? Uh, well, let me just show you some pictures of the, of the cemetery. It is absolutely beautiful. <clears throat> Are they still burying people in there? Very rarely now. I don't know where they're going. To, I don't know where they put them. They probably find a little spot somewhere. Yeah, you squeeze. You can be squeezed in. Yeah. <laughs> With a lot of cash. As an audience with Pope Pius, Oscar Wilde visited the cemetery for planning at the holiest place in the world. 
<laughs> and sure. he's, he's buried in Père Lachaise in Paris. I believe so. A pretty crazy place. Yes, yeah. do you know, thank you. Do you know Père Lachaise in Paris? Oh, it's, it's something else. It, um, what, what Abelard is there? Uh, Jim Morrison. Jim he's Morrison. Kept, Morrison yeah. I think they, he used to be there. I think they kicked him out. <laughs> no, he's still there. He's, he's still, still there. there. He's still there. That's around it because people were celebrating. Uh, and painting things, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Victor Borda said, is he still alive? <laughs> no, he's, he's still dead. <laughs> well, this is the old section. Another cat. Who's here? The famous and not so famous. Here's another cat. This is the grave of Keats. Oh, my God. Who died, of course, very young uh, uh, in uh, 1821. And this grave contains all that was mortal of a young English poet. And the next stuff in small print, the guy who wrote it, uh, about his, the bitterness of his enemies, he really regretted putting it on there. But what Keith wanted was not his name at all. His name is not on here lies one whose name was writ in water. That's what he wanted. Mm. It might make one in love with death to think that one should be buried in so sweet a place, wrote Shelley not long before he drowned in the very year <laughs> off the coast of Italy. He was slightly older, and here is his grave. Nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. Yeah. He died in 1822 at the age of 32. This is, a, this is a relation of mine. Her name was Olivia Cushing from Boston, and she married a Norwegian sculptor, and they established a utopian community in Rome. Olivia Anderson was her name. Our dream in life, a city for all nations dedicated to the creative spirit of God in man, was our hope and prayer in life. Here the dreamers sleep. This man, William Henry Dana of Boston, was a jurist, but he's most famous for a book he wrote as a very young man which the older gentleman in the room will have read, called Two Years Before the Night. Wonderful book. Who else? Right. Um, many of these inscriptions, many of these inscriptions are in English, which is why it's so much fun to go there. But they're not cryptic. They're practically books. <laughs> and as you know, if you are bereaved or have been bereaved or know someone is bereaved, you know, we go on and on. Um, this young man, here's the text. Amid these wrecks of earth and joy and cherished hope, where unfailing still the day spring from on high visits, reviving nature is laid to rest. The little that could die of Devereux Plantagenet Cockburn, late of the Royal Scots Grey, second Magoons, firstborn son of Sir Cockburn Bartholomew, of far off Britain, of deep and unprotecting piety of rare mental and corporeal endowments. He was beloved by all who knew him and most precious to his parents and family who had sought his help in many foreign climes. Why you would come to Rome from your health family Rome. Mm -hmm. Probably had consumption. I was I would assume he had consumption. Yeah. And he'd show him with his faithful dog. Mm -hmm. And that is by no means the longest description. This is probably the most famous to to a uh, Young woman named Rosa Bathurst, who was out with a riding party and her horse bucked her off into the Tiber and she drowned. And the text is fresh in the book. 
I will I will read all of it, but um <clears throat> we can read the last few sentences. She was everything that the finest heart could desire or the eye covered. The joy and hope of her weird mother. Early bright transient chase this morning. She sparkled was exhaled and went to heaven. <laughs> and this one we won't read. <laughs> Look at this. Especially a biography. Here lie the mortal remains of the Reverend Robert Finch of Bio College. Well, just outside the cemetery is the old Via Ostia Antica. And I had set up my four by five camera early one morning to photograph this beautiful light. And just as I was about to take the picture, some children came by hurrying to school. So I guessed and took the picture. I knew it would be blurry because it was a slow charge speed, but I think it worked out perfectly. This is wrong. The stones have been there for 2,000 years. And the children, like us, are just passing by. <laughs> so as they say in Rome, gee, many of <laughs> See you there. And we have plenty of time for comments and questions. Maybe I missed it, but it just didn't seem like there was much vegetation, like, like trees. Like we were always planting trees in our towns and cities. But I didn't really notice that. There actually are a lot of places with trees, but not in, this, in the historic center, which is where we spent most of our time. Um, the Protestant cemetery is loaded with trees, and uh, around that south part of Rome, uh, let me see. Now, Right here. Yeah, see, in, in these areas, there actually is quite a lot of vegetation. And look at look at this. But that's um that is still inside the wall. So yeah. Yes, no. Yes. Two questions. Uh all those cats, are they well cared for or are there stray cats that look at I'm thinking about animals as you never say? I know what. Uh, can you repeat the question for those? Of I'm you? sorry. The first question was, are there any trees? <laughs> uh, this is a question about cats. Where, how are they cared for? And yeah, sorry. Um, how, how are the cats cared for? I think we feed them in the Preston Cemetery. But the ones you see around town, uh, just do the best they can. And, you know, we had, uh, we actually had a cat that occurred at our door, which we kept for a year and then gave to our neighbor. But the people put out pasta. Pasta. Yeah, they eat pasta. Tell you. Tell you. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, but the question is uh, you live here a year. So, was there, in terms of climate, is there, was there a month or a time period uh, across the year that you was your favorite? That yeah. You what, what, over the year, course of the year, what is the climate of Rome like? And what's the best time? This is October, our, 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 our walk. But Rome gets cold. Uh, I don't know how they got along with Togas and Samuel. <laughs> Rome can get very really cold. And there's no central heating. You get a gas bomb with a heater, which is sort of dangerous. Um, and it can, of course, get very hot also. Um, but most of the year, it's pretty nice. I look it up and on that on the weather. And uh, this time of year, it's in the 70s. It's, it's very comfortable. Is there a best month? Yeah, I would say 
I would say September, October, probably October, or uh, maybe May. Yes. How safe would you say it is there? How safe? How safe? Yeah. Good question. Uh, how safe has it been wrong? I think it's actually very safe. Many a lot of pickpockets, uh, but if you're careful, uh, I'm not aware of any. I don't know. I'm sure there is some, but in the old center, I would say you're safe walking day and night because there are always people around. Yes, was Rome pretty much unscathed by uh, World War II? Good question. What what happened to Rome in World War II? And as far as I know, the Germans left and it was simply occupied by Paris. Uh, I'm not, anybody, anybody know that? Is an answer to that question? Uh, but I don't believe there was any fighting in Rome at all. Most of the fighting was south at Monte Cassino. And then the Romans, the Germans, simply left Italy. And do you think the rat lines, which got so many of the Nazi leadership out of Rome, you think that was part of it? Yes. That went to South America? Yeah. yeah. It was kind of a deal, maybe, between yeah. the Pope and mm -hmm. our Nazis, Jeez. but he protected Rome. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Very good, yes. Um, I think it was Roosevelt who said, one down, two to go up. <laughs> um, yes, please. Yes. You mentioned the tiger bird that has been flooding since forever. And do you have any sense? I know they're not near the ocean, but do you have any sense of what might be happening with climate change and with the rising the rising waters everywhere? Your question is the tiger climate change current situation uh, in Rome. And and I, I'm afraid I don't. Uh, I, I know that Europe is suffering from uh, heat and drought like we are. Um, the Tiber was the only source of water for a long time, which is, of course, deadly. <laughs> yes, question, anybody? Yeah, Yes, yes, go ahead. Is there, I got here a few minutes late. Is there anything like a central park in Rome, any large park? Or I see the piazzas, the gatherings, yes. but is there like a greenish park area? Yes, and, and that relates to, to your question. Uh, your question. Jeez. Your question. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, the Villa Borghese, where the museum was, I showed you the outside of it, where the Bernini sculptures are. That's a beautiful part. Uh, the Villa Borghese. Um, and south, right around the Protestant Cemetery, there's a lot of open space. Okay. But most of the historic center of Rome is buildings and piazzas. And, you know, I don't think, I, like you were saying, I don't think I saw a one tree. In the old in the old part of Rome, it's just not going to happen. I, I just wanted to address that too. I was just there a year ago, and the Borghese was just absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And they've got all different types of carts and things that you can ride so that you can traverse the entire area. This is Borghese or Borghese? Borghese. Borghese. It's the Borghese. B O R G H E S E. That's where the museum is. Um, and it's sort of northeast, but it's still inside the walls. Yeah, yes. Um, my favorite food memory of Rome was um, eating deep fried artichokes on a side street. I was wondering if you have a favorite food memory. Um, I had Mobar polio when I was a child, and it's very difficult for me to eat. That's why I'm so thin. <laughs> so I'm not a foodie. I just try to get some food down. Um, and uh, I do remember an outdoor cafe 
was with my professor. And a guy came around with a big tray, lasagna al forno, lasagna from the oven. Oh, yes, please. So I remember that. Um, and of course, yes, uh, ice cream. <laughs> gelato, gelato. Um, there was a guy just off Piazza Nalona who had an ice cream store, and they would scoop it out, you know. And this guy had an arm like Popeye, <laughs> and he was sort of surly. He would say, "Well, it's pistachio, davvero, really." So that, that, that happens to be my last name, Pistachio. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that you are of Italian descent. Yeah. 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 Yes, very true, yes. I wanted to make a comment about the best time to go to Rome. I've been there when the weather's been gorgeous, like April and May. I've been there at Christmas time when you could hardly move because there's so many people there. Mm -hmm. I've been there in February. I really recommend opening your mind and going to uh, Europe in the winter. I never had to get a reservation. I never had to wait in line. The Airbnbs were dirt cheap. There's no people. Yes, it's colder. Um, so but it's a very wonderful experience to uh, have a stay to yourself without a foreign Oh, okay. So you're looking for um, Oh, okay. Anybody get my phone? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, Sorry. Okay. I, you said you were there studying for a year, and I'm just wondering did you study while well you're an artist? Or did you? I'm just curious. Well, I had passed my PhD exam and I went to Rome to write my dissertation or to do the research. And I was doing research on the Catholic, too, which I probably I might have mentioned when I've written, written about that site. And I was in the Vatican Library, uh, which you have to get an ID. And of course, it's an incredible place. But and if you can go, if you can get into the Vatican Library, you can go to the Vatican Bank. You get access to inside the Vatican. And that was a really good place to cash checks because you got cash in hand and we're going to exchange it. The Italian banks are impossible. You wait in line for four hours. The Italian, the Vatican Bank is called the Banco di Santo Spirito. The Bank of the Holy Spirit. And they say their assets are intangible. <laughs> My wife was with me. She's a Germanist. Uh, and she had the things to do, and then we went on to Germany in the summer. Yes. I was thinking about the cemetery that's all crowded, and then the old one that's right adjacent yeah. to it, and the fact that they have not. Allow people in the modern day to yeah. be buried there, and is there some kind of a um, I don't know, but <laughs> so they're, they're just um, respecting the the ancient ones. I think they just want to have some open space, but as far as I know, the old section is totally closed to do burials. Maybe if you were really important, I don't know how you would. How important you would have to be to get in there. Uh, but right now, I, I don't know where they're going to put any more people. But it is a beautiful place, as, as Shelley said before he, you know, started it before he died. Where's Mussolini? Where is Mussolini? I don't know. I mean, no, where, is, where is Mussolini after he was strung up by his chairs? <laughs> <laughs> has a big. Cemetery for me. You know, I don't know what happened to Benito. Um, well, Roger, did you have a, um, a favorite uh, sculptor or artist after doing all of your research? Well, the guy I worked on, the painter who did the paintings that she made, was a really little, little Bob Journeyman. But um, 
you know, you've got a St. Bernini and Caravaggio. Yes. They're the really creative people. Bernini was incredible, as you can see. Uh, and Caravaggio will only live a very short life, totally transformed paintings. Although my favorite painter is John Vermeer. <laughs> I need to talk on him before. Well, how are we doing? Good. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.